Welcome back. Today we'll be discussing chapter 27, which covers chest and abdominal trauma. So this is really the chapter we've been waiting for to really get involved with our trauma assessments, because this is where a lot of our life-threatening uh, things that can happen traumatically to our airway take place. So we're going to cover a lot of what can happen to our ABCs with trauma in our chest and how to treat that. So this is a very critical chapter in actually saving people that have um, significant traumatic injuries. So we'll start with chest injuries and then we'll move our way down into abdominal injuries, which we also see a lot of different abdominal injuries. So chest injuries can come from a variety of causes. One of the more common ones that we see is blunt trauma. So if we have any sort of blunt um, force trauma, we start to see um, fractures of the ribs. Remember the ribs is what protects our lungs, our heart, and a few of our upper abdominal um, organs. So it's our protection cage. Uh, so blunt force trauma does fracture the ribs, which can lead to a lot of problems with the fractured parts. We also see compression type injuries, and that uh, comes from blunt force trauma, and it's where it, compress, or it comes on so hard that the chest compresses too rapidly to where the ribs cannot, can't take the entire shock, and so we start to compress the organs and great blood vessels inside of our chest, which causes quite a lot of problems. Then lastly, one of the more obvious ones are penetrating objects. So you can have your bullets and knives, anything else that might be impaled into the chest. And that obviously, if something goes inside of our chest, it will cause damage to the internal organs and the great vessels there. Our chest doesn't really have any spot where we don't have something vital sitting in there. So any sort of penetrating object to the chest is gonna cause quite a bit of issues. So as far as our general patient assessment for trauma to the chest, uh, this is where we need to think of our mechanism of injury because a lot of these injuries might not be very apparent, especially the blunt force trauma injuries. You might not see anything significantly wrong when you initially look at the patient. So think of the mechanism of injury. Is this capable of producing something wrong in the chest? Um, and then you also have to really expose and inspect the skin of the chest. This is not something that we can assess with clothes on. So expose the area and actually do a full thorough assessment. Some things that you're going to be looking for is difficulty breathing or any signs that they might be hypoxic. You might um, be looking at pain in the area. And also a huge thing that we do is a full assessment of the chest wall. You have to look, listen, and feel for the chest. So look, see if you have any major injuries. You have to listen, uh, so you make sure that you're physically moving air in and out. And then you need to feel the chest rise and fall to make sure that the chest is doing it at the same time. So you don't have one side going up while the other side's not going up. And make sure that you don't have any major uh, deformities to the chest. If you're feeling and there's a soft spot where there should be ribs, then we have to assume that there is some sort of compromise to the chest wall. So thorough assessment is really key for chest injuries. As far as patient care goes, uh, the chest does house your heart and your lungs. So that's everything involved in your ABCs is housed in your chest. So sometimes we might be finding some life threats that involve chest trauma. So that's something that we do stop and treat in our primary assessment if it is threatening to life. You should be administering oxygen if we have any um, signs that we might be compromised with your respir respiratory system. And if you are breathing inadequately, so we assess the chest and we're not moving air in and out well, then you need to use um, positive pressure ventilation, whether that's a BVM or CPAP. Typically, we go towards the end of BVM for most trauma patients, just in case if they have a pneumothorax, we do know that CPAP is contraindicated for a pneumothorax. Always reassess your patients. These are patients that might not have complaints or signs and symptoms of chest trauma initially, but they're gonna develop over time as they get worse and worse and worse, especially with pneumothorax or hemothorax, which we'll talk about a little bit later. 
keep on reassessing your respiratory rate and depth. Is that If that's changing, one or the other or both, that's a sign that the patient is getting worse, so that could be a progressing emergency happening in your chest. And then after you've assessed your ABCs and you make sure those are intact, then we'll treat the specific chest emergencies during the secondary assessment. So if you have just a normal laceration or anything that's not life-threatening, that's when we treat it as in our secondary assessment as we discover it. So we have two different categories of chest injuries. We either have open injuries or closed injuries. So this refers to if there's a break in the skin. So a lot of the injuries we see are actually going to end up being closed injuries. Uh, this is injuries usually resulting from blunt force trauma. So we will talk about all these individually, but some closed injuries that we see are flail chest, a pneumothorax or a hemothorax, a cardiac tamponade, or internal explosion of the tissue from compression. Uh, that's just a small list of some of the closed injuries that we see, but these are some of the more life-threatening closed injuries that you see. As far as open injuries, usually this is as a cause of some sort of penetrating trauma, so we have an opening to the outside world. Uh, we're going to be seeing sucking chest wounds is one of the big issues that we see, and then just outright destruction of tissue. If a bullet tears through your chest, it's going to destroy the tissue there. It's no longer going to be intact. So that's stuff that we have to be thinking about. Again, we're going to cover all these different emergencies in the next coming slides. So the first closed chest injury that we need to talk about is flail chest. So a flail chest happens from the fracture of ribs, and it's two or more consecutive ribs in two or more places. So there will be a diagram in the next slide that kind of illustrates this um, and we'll talk about why this is can develop into a very big respiratory emergency one thing that is very characteristic of a flail segment or flail chest is you'll have paradoxical motion in your chest so that's where one side of the chest goes up and the other side goes down um, so you're going to see not equal chest rise which is why we have to be feeling and looking for equal chest rise and fall so right here is a diagram of a flail segment. So you can see uh, you have a rib that's broken in two places and you have at least two of them. This one actually has quite a few. But if we just imagine just these two, this is what qualifies as a flail segment. So if we can fracture these in two places, that means that we no longer have any continuality of the rib. And if you have this in two spots, especially consecutive two spots, we now have this big area right here that has no support. So the issue with a flail segment when we don't have the support right here is when you breathe, remember we work off of changes in pressure, so your diaphragm goes down, creates negative space. That only works if you have the sealed vault that is your thorax. If you break your ribs in this manner, you no longer have that structure to provide that vault. So the negative pressure happens and the um, area of the chest right there will suck into you <clears throat> because there's nothing that holds your chest in place. So that becomes quite a, a big issue because if you can't create that negative pressure on that one side because the chest wall is sucking in, your lung can't inflate because you're not feeling the effects of that negative pressure anymore. So that's where it becomes an emergency because we can only inflate one of our lungs. And that's why we see the paradoxical movement of one side going up, the other one's not because the other one doesn't have the structure of the ribs to fight against that negative pressure and inflate the lungs. It just kind of sucks in when it feels that negative pressure. The lung can't actually inflate. And as you can see here, inspiration happens, the flail segment moves in Expiration happens, flail segment moves out, which again causes it so our lung can't actually inflate. So as in terms of treating this, there is a little bit of debate as to what the best possible treatment is. First thing that no one contests 
is positive pressure should help this. So using BVM ventilations, where we are forcing the lungs to inflate with positive pressure instead of working off of negative pressure, that will cause the lung to inflate regardless. So that's one of our primary treatments for a flail segment is to put positive pressure into the chest. The next treatment, which again is up for a little bit of debate, some EMT instructors still teach this, some don't, so I will inform you guys of this, is treating this with a bulky dressing. So the purpose behind treating this with a bulky dressing is if we have this segment where we have no structure anymore, if we put a bulky dressing, like maybe a, a good pillow or even a folded up blanket, and we put it right here and we um, put some pressure on that area, we now kind of take the place of these three ribs because this bulky dressing right here will provide the structure to the chest that we need and so that we can fight against the negative pressure and let the lung inflate the way it's supposed to inflate. So again, that's under review. Um, a lot of people have stopped teaching in that way. I just wanted to give you guys that information um, because there is still some people out there that treat it this way and I wouldn't really fault you for treating it this way. The only thing you have to be very careful of is not to put so much weight there or to tie it down so much that you restrict breathing. So you don't want to put so much pressure there that we can't expand our chest at all and we can't inflate the other lung. That's one of the issues we were seeing was people were putting too much weight there and it was making it even harder for a patient to breathe. So that's a flail segment. You know, we will treat it with positive pressure regardless. And then the bulky dressing, I'm going to leave up to your guys' interpretation. So some injuries within the chest cavity that we see. We'll talk about each one of these individually. We have pneumothorax, hemothorax, and hemopneumothorax, traumatic as as asphyxia, cardiac tamponade, and aortic injury and dissection. So pneumothorax and tension pneumothorax. We talked about pneumothorax during respiratory, so I'm not going to cover all of it um, today. Uh, so a pneumothorax is when air is entering the pleural space, the chest cavity. Uh, this can happen one of two ways. Either we have a hole in our lung tissue, and so air is getting out from our lung, or we have a hole in our chest cavity and atmospheric air is getting in that way. So it happens one of two ways. Um, when we're talking about closed chest injuries, it's going to be caused by a hole in the actual lung. When we talk about open chest injuries, it's usually caused by a penetrating force causing a um, hole in the chest cavity. So this becomes an issue because every time that the patient breathes, so we'll right now talk about when uh, there's a hole in the lung, every time the patient breathes, air rushes into the lungs and if there's a hole in the lung, it's going to go outside and sit into the pleural space. When you breathe enough times, you get so much air into the pleural space that it starts putting uh, pressure on your lung itself that's when we get to what's called a tension pneumothorax because air is going into the pleural space, it can't get out. So it's going to start putting pressure or tension on your lung. So it will start to deflate the first lung that is having the problem. And then after that, it starts to push on the other side. So it will affect the um, opposite lung and it will affect the heart because it's putting pressure on the heart. So that's what, um, what we call a tension pneumothorax, which is a life-threatening emergency. So for signs and symptoms of pneumothorax and tension pneumothorax, first you're going to start to have diminished lung sounds on the side that the hole's on. It could be diminished or completely absent, and that's because our lung's not actually inflating anymore. You're going to see jugular vein distension because we have all that pressure that's pushing on the heart. We're going to make it so the heart can't pump effectively, so we're going to have a backup of fluid. That fluid backs up into the biggest spaces it can find, one of which is your jugular veins. So jugular veins are going to have a lot more blood in it. They're going to become distended. We're going to be able to see it in our neck. 
you're going to probably see a lot of chest pain. You will definitely see a lot of very severe difficulty breathing. You'll probably see tachycardia and hypotension. Tachycardia because your body realizes that it's not being perfused as well, so it compensates and jacks the heart rate up. And then hypotension because again, we are putting pressure on the heart. If we put pressure on the heart, it can't contract as well and can't refill as well. So it won't be able to push out with as much force as it's used to. So we get hypotension. And then a very late sign, you might see tracheal deviation. That's where the trachea is going to be pushed away from the affected side. And that's because we've put so much pressure inside of our chest that we've actually physically moved the structures away from wherever the hole is. And so you will see your trachea start to shift away because we've moved our entire mediastinum away. Again, that's a very late sign. If you see that, the patient is either dead or near death. So we also have hemothorax and hemoneumothorax. So if we break those words down, hemo is blood, and then hemoneumo is blood and air. So exact same principles, just you add blood to the mix. So in a hemothorax, exact same thing happening, you just have it with blood instead of air. And hemoneumothorax, exact same thing happening, you just have blood and air. So here's some diagrams of, on the left you have the pneumothorax, in the middle is the hemothorax, and on the right you have a hemoneumothorax. I will tell you, in most of the patients that I've had that have had some, some sort of pneumothorax that I've had to treat, it's been a hemoneumothorax. It's been some sort of penetrating injury that's causing blood and air loss. So personally, that's what I see more often, but you can see any one of these. So next we'll talk about traumatic asphyxia. So that's where we have a sudden compression of the chest um, from usually some sort of very significant blunt force trauma. And that sudden compression of the chest will put so much pressure inside the chest that it forces the blood out of the organs and it can rupture blood vessels. This will also cause ruptures of tissue in the lungs and the heart. So if we rupture the tissue, we can no longer use those things. And if you can no longer use your heart or lungs, you can't perfuse your body anymore. So traumatic as asphyxia usually results in someone dying. Uh, you might see the neck and face that are a darker color than the rest of the body. And that's because blood can't return back to the heart. So it's trapped up there. You might see bulging eyes, JVD, and broken blood vessels in the face just from all the sudden force. The only time that I've ever seen tra traumatic asphyxia in the field was when a uh, mechanic was working on a car, was underneath it, and the car gave way, and the tire fell right down on his chest. So it compressed it. It actually didn't come back up, but that's one of the only times I've ever actually definitively seen traumatic asphyxia in the field. And he did have all these signs. He had uh, his n neck and face were very dark. They were purple. Eyes were bulging out, had JVD. Um, so all these signs were there. So it does happen. It usually takes a significant amount of force, though. So next we'll talk about cardiac tamponade. So you have to remember the heart is surrounded by this sac. It's a airtight, very tough sac. It's called the pericardial sac. It has a little bit of fluid in it. It's meant to have that little bit of fluid in it, and it's rarely lets anything in or out. So that's what a normal heart has. If you have a direct injury to the heart, you can cause the heart to start to bleed, and if the muscle of the heart bleeds, it will go into, the fluid will go into this pericardial sac. Now, since the pericardial sac does not let things out of it, if we bleed into it, you're going to start to increase the pressure that's around the heart because you just, you have this very small sac and you put a lot of fluid into it, it's going to start push inwards towards the heart. If we push inwards to the heart, we're not going to allow the heart to compress and then refill as adequately. We won't have as good of circulation happening. So that becomes quite the problem if we can't refill the heart and then compress it as easily. So the um, 
issues we see is the blood will start to back up into the veins, so you're going to start to see jugular vein distension. Um, we are going to have tachycardia because the heart recognizes it's not pushing out as much blood, so it tries to speed the rate up. And you'll have hypotension because you won't be able to compress the heart as well. This can be caused by either blunt or penetrating trauma. So either one of these can cause a cardiac tamponade and is a very life-threatening emergency. When it comes to remembering the symptoms behind cardiac tamponade, we have what's called Beck's triad. So Beck's triad looks for the three big things that you'll see is hypotension, jugular vein distension, then decreased or muffled heart sounds. Now, we as EMS providers don't typically listen to heart sounds, and if you don't listen to something, you won't know if something's abnormal. So decreased or muffled heart sounds isn't something we're really assessing for because we don't know what's normal and what would be decreased or muffled. So you have to really focus on the hypotension and the jugular vein distension that is accompanied with the blunt or penetrating trauma in the chest. Unfortunately, we see this with a lot of other chest injuries, such as tension pneumothorax. So we won't be able to definitively diagnose this in the field. And we also don't treat this in the field. The treatment for this is to actually take a needle and um, put the needle inside of the pericardium and withdraw the fluid out of there. That's not something we're doing in the field. That's something the hospital does. So we treat this the same as most uh, chest injuries, especially most close chest injuries, and we just recognize that the heart is has something obstructing its ability to pump. So we need to get this patient to definitive care very fast so that they can fix it, whatever is causing that. Okay, next we'll talk about aortic injury and dissection. So we talked about this quite a bit in abdominal emergencies, a little bit in cardiovascular emergencies when it's caused by an aneurysm. But just a um, one-time blunt force injury can cause um, injury and dissection of the aorta, whether that's from pressure from blunt force or a penetrating trauma that actually tears the aorta. As we know from talking about this before, if you put a hole in the aorta, that's generally game over. You're, you move way too much of your body's blood supply through your aorta that you're going to sanguinate very, very quickly. So keep that in mind. It's usually pretty fatal, and it's usually these patients are dead before we even get there. So do know that aortic injury can happen and there's unfortunately not much that we can really do about it. These patients usually bleed out in front of us. If they are conscious, they'll probably complain of pain in the chest, it might be in the abdomen or back. They should show signs of shock because they are going into hypovolemic shock very quickly. And if it's a small uh, tear where you aren't bleeding out completely, you might see differences in the blood pressure between the arms or differences between um, the pulse strength between the arms and the legs. And this is a very hard sign to really get to, but if you notice that one arm has a blood pressure of 150 over 80, the other arm has a blood pressure of 80 over 60, that means that there might be a tear in the aorta between where the artery, the brachial artery going to one arm and the brachial artery going to the other arm is. So we're getting good pressure to the arm that has um, that um, is before the tear, but we won't have good pressure going to the artery that goes to the arm after the tear. So not something we commonly see. Like I said, with most aortic injuries and dissections, these patients are bleeding out very quickly. So one more rare thing that we see uh, with a closed chest injury is uh, commodio cordis. So I'm sure everyone's heard about this before. Uh, this is where like a a uh, very young, usually, athlete uh, takes some sort of hit to the chest and then just drops dead. So this is usually seen in sports, and it's usually seen where you have a sudden blunt force directly to the chest. Um, this only happens if the blunt force happens exactly when the heart is in a vulnerable state. It <clears throat> creates what's called an R on T phenomenon. So this is if the heart is in its repolarization phase, which I don't expect you guys to know the, the different phases of the heart, but after the heart beats, it has to repolarize or get ready to beat again. So all the electrolytes in the heart are shifting 
around, and during that repolarization phase, it physically cannot beat again. The electric pathways of the heart just are not charged properly. So if you have blunt force trauma exactly during that repolarization phase, you can cause the heart to want to depolarize again. And if it deep polarizes when it physically can't depolarize, it's going to send the patient into ventricular fibrillation because it, you just disrupted its entire electrical flow of things. So that's why they drop dead and they usually are in a ventricular fibrillation um, heart rhythm. And so we treat this exactly like we would any other ventricular fibrillation where we do CPR and defibrillate the patient. This is why most sporting events have an AED um, very easily accessible in case of this happens, because this is, these are patients that are usually normally very healthy, and if we defibrillate them, they should come back. Doesn't mean they always will, but this is something that we do end up seeing. It did happen recently to my hometown. By recently, I mean within about the past 10 years. But it's been within my EMS career where a lacrosse player got hit in the chest with a lacrosse ball and this actually happened and the athletic trainers on site were able to defibrillate the patient and they were, were conscious before the ambulance even arrived on scene. So this does happen. It's not too common, but it does happen. So our general treatment for closed chest injuries is give positive pressure ventilation if it's needed. If the chest wall is unstable stabilize it so that's where we talk about some of our bulky dressings you can stabilize the chest wall you administer oxygen you do your general treatment for shock if they're going into shock and then we need to get these patients to the hospital I request als intercept on the way but again with our general trauma patients we really need to get them in front of a trauma surgeon that's what really matters so have ALS intercept you, but don't be waiting around on scene for them. This is These are patients that we need to get going to the hospital. So going into open chest injuries. So we have two major things that we're concerned about with open chest injuries. Again, this is usually like penetrating chest injuries. First one we see is a sucking chest wound, and the next one is tissue destruction. So again, tissue destruction is if like a bullet rips through your chest, you're going to destroy a lot of the tissue. And if the tissue is destroyed, you can't use it anymore. So a lot of times that's fatal. That's why if you get shot in the chest, it's oftentimes fatal. Uh, do keep in mind that open injuries can oftentimes cause a pneumothorax. And that's because air is coming in from the outside. We'll talk about that a little later. So the... One issue with open chest injuries is it's hard for us to really tell what's injured from just the entrance wound. Remember, bullets have cavitation things, so just because it enters in one spot doesn't mean that you aren't causing tissue destruction in areas around that spot because of the cavitation. But also, if it's a projectile, it can hit a bone and deflect and bounce places. Some bullets are meant to kind of mushroom out and not leave the body. They're meant to kind of ping pong around inside the body. So just because it entered one area doesn't mean that that's where it stayed. It could have deflected and went another area completely. So it's very hard for us to know exactly what's being affected. So you have to assume all penetrating injuries to the trunk are life-threatening. Um, when we have a open injury to the chest, it usually allows air into it into the chest, which throws off the pressure that makes us breathe well and uses, usually causes a pneumothorax. <clears throat> so one thing that we look for is called a sucking chest wound so that's where we do have the opening to the atmosphere um, from our chest cavity and so when we breathe air will suck into our uh, thorax that's because we create the negative pressure and air is supposed to want to come in just usually comes in through our airway but if we have the negative pressure it's going to come in through the from the atmosphere into our chest we call this a sucking chest wound because sometimes there is an actual physical sucking sound. So you hear them breathe and you'll um, hear actual sucking going on around that wound, but you might not hear that. Um, if you leave this untreated, it's going to 
or lead to a pneumothorax. So you're going to have the exact same signs that you see of a pneumothorax. That's because we're putting air into the thorax and um, you have the exact same thing happening, just it's coming from the outside instead of coming from the inside of via a hole in the lung. But we have the exact same problems happening. So it's something that we do have to end up treating for. So our patient care for sucking chest wounds, first maintain your open airway. Then we need to seal the wound. So we seal the wound with an occlusive dressing, which we're going to talk about in the next slide. After you seal the wound, you administer high concentration oxygen, care, do care for shock, and then transport and have ALS intercept on the way. So an occlusive dressing. Occlusive dressing is something that doesn't allow air through it. So usually this is gauze that is soaked in petroleum. If you want to improvise, uh, anything that has like plastic on the outside usually works pretty well. So you just want something that air can't easily pass through. So we are putting this on the sucking chest wound so that when you breathe in, air can't pass through the dressing and can't get into the thorax. When we put the occlusive dressing on, you want to tape it from three sides. So you leave one, one side not fully taped and that allows a flutter valve. So when you breathe in, the occlusive dressing will suck to your chest so air can't get out. But when you breathe out and we have pressure coming from the chest outwards, the air that's actually already in your chest or your thorax was going to want to push out. And so we let that flutter valve let the air escape. So it is important that we do leave a free corner open so that it will let the air out but won't let air in. Now you can use this as a precaution. If you don't see the signs or symptoms of a, a pneumothorax yet, but you have a open penetrating wound to the chest, go ahead and seal it off. Just because you don't see the symptoms yet, we want to make sure that air doesn't get in there. So you can use it as a precaution. So here's a diagram of air wants to try to come in, but this sucks straight down to the chest so it can't get in and we do have this corner open so that when you breathe out we have all this pressure pushing out that way so it's going to push on this open corner and want to escape out to the atmosphere so some things you want to think about is does the patient's chest injury need to be treated during the primary assessment a lot of times, yes, because it's causing an issue to our ABCs. And if we have an issue to our ABCs, we treat it in the primary assessment. Does the open chest injury require an inclusive dressing? Again, personally, I usually put these on precaution or precautionarily just in case if it's getting air in. And then does the patient's injury necessitate immediate transport to a trauma center? And that's usually if you have a good chest injury where you're seeing any of these things happening, yes, they have to go to a trauma center. There is a specific list of guidelines that will tell you when you need to go to a level one trauma center. I hand it out during class. If you lost it, feel free to uh, ask me for another copy. But there is a actual list composed by the American College of Surgeons, I believe, that will tell you these specific things. If you see them, this patient should be going to a trauma center. So now we're going to move on into abdominal injuries. So just like the chest, abdominal injuries can either be open or closed. The big thing that we worry about with abdominal injuries is internal bleeding. Uh, if you um, rupture or lacerate a organ or blood vessel in your abdomen, you can have significant, significant amounts of bleeding. Um, that becomes an issue with us because it's very hard for us to catch this bleeding because the abdomen can hold all of your body's blood inside of it without it coming out anywhere. So uh, especially with blunt force trauma to the abdomen, you have to be very, very wary of uh, bleeding happening that you can't see. Uh, if you have a hollow organ rupture from blunt force or from a penetrating injury, you should have very serious pain to the area and you might have some retractions that you see. One thing that we see with open injuries are eviscerations. So if you, uh, especially like a stab wound, if you cut through your peritoneum, which is what holds your uh, intestines in place, that's where your intestines are going to want to come out through the wound opening. So you might actually see your organs coming through the wound openings. That's called an evisceration. <laughs> 
So right here is a, a picture of a evisceration. Right here you can see that you have the intestine coming out. So that's a very serious medical emergency. As far as patient assessment, they'll probably have pain to the area. To the area, um, usually it's progressing pain as things are bleeding or um, rupturing even more. You're going to have more and more pain. So we'll start out mild, but shoot, it usually becomes very, very intense pain. You might have cramps. You might have nausea, weakness, thirst, and you might see obvious lacerations and puncture wounds to the abdomen, especially with our open wounds. That This is stuff that's probably gonna be pretty obvious, just like the last picture that we just saw. Some more things that you might see, um, you have to think of your mechanism of injury. So if you have a mechanism that's consistent with abdominal trauma, such as a car accident and they have their seatbelt on, you might have a blunt force trauma to where their seatbelt was sitting on their abdomen. Look for signs of developing shock. Again, our internal bleeding is very hard to assess, so you have to look for signs of shock coming, even though you don't see obvious bleeding happening. If they're coughing up or vomiting blood, or they have a episode of diarrhea and there's blood in the diarrhea, that's a good sign that there's probably bleeding happening in your GI tract. Rigid or tender abdomen or a distended abdomen is usually a sign of blood going on or you might have ruptured organs. And the patient will usually try to lie very still because it's going to be very painful for them to move. If they move, they're going to aggravate any of these ruptured areas and it's going to be very painful for them. So they want to stay very still usually. So as far as patient care, um, if it's a closed injury, we have steps very similar to most of our GI bleeding. Unfortunately, there's not much we can do for it. So be aware that they might be vomiting. Um, make sure that their airway stays open and you suction it out if they do start vomiting. Uh, place the patient on their back and with the, their knees flex, or with their legs flexed at their knees. This is going to take a little bit of pressure off of their abdominal muscles, which is going to take away some of the pain. A lot of patients will naturally want to do this because it relieves a little bit of pain. And then your general care for shock. So high concentration of oxygen, keep them warm, lay them supine, and transport to the hospital. Obviously, we don't want to be giving these patients anything by mouth. Uh, you want to continually reassess them and transport them very quickly. And also, be cognizant of how much blood passes through some of our abdominal organs, such as our spleen and our liver. There's a lot of blood that goes through there. So if either one of those gets lacerated, a lot of blood loss can happen. This is why we really need to know our anatomy and physiology at this point. So if you have a actual injury, so it's an open injury, you want to try to control external bleeding the best you, that you can. Sometimes this is hard um, because we can't just tie a dress or dressing around the abdomen very easily. So a lot of times this is where someone has to manually hold that dressing to the abdomen the entire time. I've had more than one call where I, I tie up an EMT the entire call just holding direct pressure on the abdomen. If you have an eviscerated organ, do not try to push it back in. Don't touch it. Just apply a sterile dressing over it and try to moisten that sterile dressing with a little bit of saline before you actually put it on the organ. That way we don't dry the organ out. So just cover it. Do not try to put it back in. Again, don't try to put anything back in. And if anything is impaled, we are not removing it. So keep any impaled object in place. If you do have anything impaled, try to stabilize it with bulky dressings and hold it in place. Uh, leave the patient's legs in the position that they're found because if you move the legs, you're going to contract the abdominal muscles and that might move your impaled object. All right, so going on to a little bit of chapter review. An open chest or abdominal wound is considered to be one that penetrates not only the skin, but the chest and abdominal wall to expose internal organs. Open chest and abdominal wounds are life-threatening. For an open chest or abdominal, abdominal wound, apply an occlusive dressing. For both open and closed injuries, stay, 
take appropriate standard precautions, note the mechanism of injury, protect the patient's airway and breathing, administer high concentration of oxygen by non-rebreather mask, treat for shock, and transport. A flail chest is characterized by the paradoxical motion. If the patient is unable to adequately breathe, assist the patient's ventilations. Seal an open chest wound with an occlusive dressing taped on three sides or in some other manner so it acts as a one-way valve, allowing air out of the chest but not in. Alternatively, use a commercial device such as the Asherman chest seal with a one-way valve to relieve pressure. Monitor the patient for changes and be prepared to manually relieve any pressure in the chest. Closed chest wounds are sometimes difficult to distinguish or may occur together. Assess the patient, including breath sounds, and maintain ventilation, oxygen, and perfusion. A patient who collapses in cardiac arrest after a force to the center of the chest should receive CPR and defibrillation like any other arrest from a cardiac cause. If the patient develops signs of tension pneumothorax, arrange immediately for ALS intercept and or transport the patient to a facility that can treat this injury. When solid abdominal organs are injured, life-threatening amounts of blood loss can occur. When hollow abdominal organs are injured, their contents spill into the abdominal cavity, causing irritation. Remember, blunt trauma, penetrating trauma, and compression are mechanisms that can injure the chest and abdomen. Open or closed pertains to the integrity of the chest or abdominal wall after the injury. Remember to seal the open chest wounds to prevent air from entering the chest cavity. Remember, closed chest and abdominal wounds bear a high risk for underlying organ system damage and internal bleeding. Use mechanism of injury and patient assessment to recognize the signs and symptoms of shock. Remember, EMTs should learn signs and symptoms and treatment procedures for specific chest and abdominal injuries. You should ask yourself, is the patient's breathing adequate, inadequate, or absent? Is the patient displaying signs of shock? Is there an open wound in the chest that needs to be sealed? Is the patient displaying signs of tension pneumothorax? Is there an open wound in the abdomen that needs to be dressed and covered? So you're caring for a patient who was shot in the chest with a nail gun. You applied an occlusive dressing around the wound. The patient is suddenly deteriorating. He, has a, he is having extreme difficulty breathing and his color has worsened. Breath sounds have become almost totally absent on the side with the impaled nail. What complication might you suspect is causing his worsening condition? How could this be corrected? So this sounds like he is developing a pneumothorax. So this patient needs to have that fixed. Um, unfortunately, at the basic level, we can't. So you need to call for ALS to do a uh, needle chest decompression and or transport to a trauma center for a uh, for a chest tube. So that is the definitive treatment. So we need to get that stuff working very quickly before this tension pneumothorax causes cardiac arrest. So that brings us to the end of this chapter. A lot of content we covered relatively quickly here. And a lot of this is life-saving stuff to know, especially how to treat your chest injuries um, and to stop it from progressing. So feel free to review this again. And we will be reinforcing a lot of this with our practical skills because these are things that we have to be very proficient at before we actually see it in the field because when we see it in the field, seconds matter and we have to be able to deploy these treatments very quickly. So until next time.